Guruve Gaur Chanjaya Radhikaya Tadare Krishnaya Krishna Bhaktaya Tad Bhaktaya Namo Namaha Vanchakalpa Truvyascha Kripa Shinduve Bhaja Patitana Bhaganevya Vaishnavevya Namo Namaha Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hari 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 Rama Hari Rama 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 Hari Hari My Dandavat Pranam devotees. So <clears throat> this is a short uh, question and answer uh, session that I received uh, a couple of questions this morning from a devotee who's very uh, very close to me and uh, I've known for many many years and um, she's also done so much service in general for uh, Srila Prabhupada's mission and also uh, for the mission of our Guru Varga. She's hosted um, basically uh, Sunday Zoom classes uh, that I've participated or facilitated for uh, quite a while and has herself preached to so many devotees and uh, brought them into the fold of Krishna consciousness. So I'd never mention names here because um, I don't have permission to do it. <laughs> but uh, anyways, so... Uh, I posted what the questions were. Dhanavat Sadhana Siddha Prabhu, very nice talking to you this morning as well. You always give me so much inspiration, Prabhuji, honestly. Um, so, um, she wrote in two questions, and I thought I would answer them. She wrote one other uh, part here, but we kind of dealt with that personally. I spoke to her this morning, actually. Uh, but the two questions that uh, we wanted to share was, one is that when personalities uh, merge essentially into the Brahma Jyoti, uh, where do they go from there? Uh, and how is this place liberating? So uh, she gives a reference to Srimad Bhagavatam 2, 7, 34 and 35. Uh, so I didn't get a chance to look at that, but I'll answer the question based on uh, what I do have at hand regarding understanding the nature of obtaining the Brahma Jyoti. So, the jiva who's bound in the material world, uh, from time without any beginning, when by the good fortune of um, a sadhu, they have the influence of spiritual energy, and they're able to, by the first manifestation of that spiritual energy, which is Shraddha, faith, able to break the Abhinavesh in material energy, they can then turn towards the ideal of spiritual uh, understanding. So prior to that causeless mercy, it is called Yadrichaya. Yadrichaya in Sanskrit means something that's causeless. <laughs> There's really no other words. I mean, most of, many of our acharyas have given definition to this phrase, Yadrichaya, like in the verse, Yadrichaya Matkatado, right? So, Adi Sridhar Swami, who's the original commentator on Srimad Bhagavatam, he wrote, uh, Yadrichaya kenapi ati bhagyena. That the word Yadrichaya means excessively, ati means excessively, bhagyena means fortunate. Srila Vishnu Chakravati Thakur Paj in his Madhuja Kanda meaning, he expanded on that meaning in order to clear the idea that this good fortune doesn't arise from any material arrangement, but that this good fortune is really the byproduct of the uh, drop of causeless mercy of the spiritual energy coming from a sadhu. So he wrote, uh, that the nature of this good fortune Causeless good fortune, Yadrichaya, is the Paramaswatantra Bhagavad Bhakta. Means that the devotee who is empowered by Bhagavan and who, in the service of Bhagavan, is distributing Bhagavan's mercy. Because it's described in Madhuja Kandam, meaning that the Lord Himself especially does not directly give bhakti. And this is because. He would be attributed with the fault of asamya dosh. Asamya, asamya means partiality. So Bhagavan has the 
wishings that everyone should serve. Therefore, Bhagavan does things to inspire us to come to his service. He descends in so many various avatars. He performs leelas, which are then recorded in innumerable sastra, which we then have recorded and a chance to hear and remember those wonderful leelas of Bhagavan. In the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, it's directly mentioned there, Nugrahaya Bhaktanam, Ah, Manushinam Dehinam Astita. Bajate Tadrisi Kritva Yatsutva Tatparovavet. That by hearing, especially Lila, like especially Ras Lila's highest class of Lila. So there should be some maturation, some adhikar, and certainly should be under guidance to hear. But it has such amazing power to remove even the deepest material impressions of lust, what to speak of everything else. Right? So here <clears throat> it's being described that the Paramasutantra Bhagavad Bhakta, in order to serve Bhagavan, and because Bhagavan will not be attributed with the fault of Asamya Dosh, then Bhagavan empowers a devotee to be the repository and the sort of postman, if you will, of disseminating bhakti. You understand? And even that devotee, whose Paramaswatantra Bhagavad Bhakta means Bhagavad Bhakta is different levels. So that who is person who is Uttam Bhagavat, highest class of Bhagavat, they also really don't distribute bhakti per se. Mercy is derived from their asiba, means their blessing, their association, even their darshan, right? But they don't distribute bhakti because they believe, asava bhutam yapa said bhagavam bhavam atmanaha. They think everybody's serving Krishna. So they don't see that there are those who are not serving Krishna. You understand? So that Bhagavat Bhakta, Uttam Bhagavat Bhakta, huh, descends to the Majjam platform. The Majjam platform here means mm, they are still pure Vaishnava, pure devotee. But they come to a platform in which the natural vision of the landscape of the various levels of consciousness in the material world is visible to them. Therefore, they operate under four principles. Prema, Maitri, Kripa, and Upeksha. Sakaroti Samadjama. This is called the Majjam platform. So, first they have praying for Bhagavan. Secondly, they have Maitri, or loving, affectionate relationship with devotees. And they are very merciful, Kripa, to those persons who are innocent in the sense that they are in ignorance of their spiritual nature. They are very merciful to those persons and try to give them spiritual encouragement and spiritual understanding. And they may demonstrate a picture. A picture means neglect. To whom will they be neglectful? Oh, those who are openly blasphemous, those who are uh, uh, against the service of Bhagavan, those who are against the service of uh, Vaishnavas, etc. They may show a picture to them. In some cases, you'll see that their mercy is so strong it may exceed even the, the structure of that, um, that template, right? Like in the instance of Prahalad Maharaj. Though his father demonstrated openly, of course it is a lila because uh, Hinani Kasipu was actually Jai, <laughs> one of the dear servants of Sri Narayan. But in this lila, he demonstrated qualities which were completely against all spiritual uh, dharma. But still, Prahalad Maharaj showed him mercy. You understand? By encouraging him. Now, there's a very deep thing behind this because in Srimad Bhagavatam, third canto, it's mentioned there. Some Rama, some Britya, Samadhi, Anubhadi Yog. That actually the pastime of Jai and Vijay, appearing as Hiranyaksha and Hiranyaka Sipu, was actually a form of bhakti. So, this is not easily digestible to ordinary people. So, generally, people will take only the Upakyan of the Lila. Upakyan means the teaching of the Lila, the moral of the story, so to speak. And the moral here is that how, first of all, Harinam is so powerful that Harinam can fully protect someone. So it gives inspiration for doing Saranagati, because part of Saranagati is Rakshashiti, that Bhagavan is my protector. So in the beginning, when Hirani Kasipu was trying to kill Prahalad Maharaj in different ways, Narasimha Dev did not appear. 
Only Prahlad Maharaj was chanting Harinam. And the Srinadev did not appear. So this was to prove that Harinam is itself non different from Bhagavan and that one is fully protected just by Harinam. Then later on, when the Srinadev actually does appear, rather than appearing in the form in which Prahlad Maharaj had deep love and affection, which is the form of Krishna, because Akantiki Hari Bhakti Govinda, it's mentioned that his Ishtadev was Govinda. Understand? So, but instead of appearing in that form, he appeared in the form of Narasimha, which was the exact form which aligned with the aspirations, uh, or not the aspirations, but aligned with the desire of the mm, wanting immortality that was expressed by Hiranyakasipu. He prayed to Brahma, oh, I don't want to be killed in the day and the night, but he especially prayed not by any being created by you, also not by any man or any animal, etc., etc., so that form of Narasimha Dev is completely manifestation of the uniqueness of an exchange of deep love between Jai and Sri Narayan in the form of the Leela of Hiranya Kasipu and Narasimha Dev. Anyways, I don't want to get too far off my track, but it was such a deep, beautiful Leela and Kata involved here. But it will get us off our track. Anyway, the Madhyam Vaishnav may occasionally, like Prahlad Maharaj, even exceed that template and show even affection to those who are unworthy of receiving that. That's the upakyan to be taken from this. So, in this regard, the word yadvichaya means the distribution of bhakti by a devotee. Right? So, Diddy's question, I'm going to go back and refer to this question again, just so I make sure I stay on track. Ah, so now she's asking, uh, it was the asking of what happens to those who merge into the Brahman. So once anyone receives some way, form, or fashion, this mm, Yadvichaya Kripa, causeless Kripa of a Sadhu, even if that Sadhu is not Vaishnav Sadhu. Should the Prophet has mentioned there are two types of Sadhus, those who are inclined towards the Gyan and Yog, which will yield different levels of realization and those who are inclined towards bhakti, which will reveal the nature of service to Bhagavan, right, at various levels. So those who receive the creep of any sadhu and they take to the path of spiritual life via the processes of jnana or yoga, etc., then they will have various levels of realization, like they will come to know that there's a difference between the atma and the material body and the subtle body, etc. And they will taste a kind of happiness called Atma Ananda. Because Jim Goswami Pad is written in Paramatma Sandhava, he was quoting from Padma Puran all of the 21 qualities of the Atma from an ontological perspective. Ontological means like just an examination of the Atma, because the Atma is always existing in two conditions, liberated or bound. But here he's taking a, a sort of ontological, it's called philosophical, look at the Atma, right? To analyze its qualities, right? Just like in Bhagavad Gita, the soul can't be burned by fire, uh, wet by water, etc., etc., withered by the wind. So here, Jiva Goswami is given 21 qualities. Among those qualities is Chit Ananda Atmaka. Then he comments, Chit Ananda Atmaka means that the mm, Jiva is Dukkha Pratyogita. So Dukkha Pratyogita means that they are the complete opposite of misery. There's no dukkha or misery in the Atma itself. I've explained this many times, that actually misery or dukkha is a byproduct of the avijja shakti. Avijja means ignorance, potency, right? Actually, literally, avijja means avijja, without knowledge of your own spiritual nature. Because sometimes when you use the word ignorance, it, it has a, a more negative connotation, right? But really, avidya means just not having knowledge of your spiritual nature. This is avidya. So in that avidya, then the jiva, by identification with asmita, with the false uh, sense of who they think they are, it's called asmita, and then ahamkara comes and sort of becomes a basis of support for asmita. Asmi means I am, right? It refers to I am something, right? Like in the verse, Tavai Vasmi, Tavai Vasmi, Na Jivami Toyavina, we pray, O Radhika, 
right? I'm praying, I want to be your dasi. You understand? So asmi means a, a self-conception, a, a self-identity. When that asmi, uh, asmita, that state of, of who I am, is corrupted by ahamkar. Aham means I am the karna and karata. I am the doer and the cause of everything in my life. Right? <laughs> so of course, it's called false ego because Bhagavad Gita states, Prakriti kriya monani gunai kamani savasha ahamkara vimudatma karta miti manyate that this presence of ahamkara is a bewilderment of your real identity. So when this asmita ahamkara and then a upadi, upadi means according to your karma, you get a particular designation in a particular family, etc., etc., in a particular race, particular gender, a particular uh, nationality, all these different things. Right, due to your karmic package, right, <clears throat> then you have an upadi, right, which means a particular direct personal identifier, <laughs> right, that's based on false ego. So, anyway, the Atma's identification with that is the cause of dukkha. Dukkha or misery is not in the Atma itself, it comes from the vicarious identification with the asmita, hamkara, and upadi. You understand? And then according to your karmic package, various kinds of things come up and identifying with those things, the jiva experiences a happiness and distress. You understand? So by the influence of a sadhu in the process of yoga, gyan, one comes to understand the atma to be unrelated to and unaffiliated completely with the subtle and gross body. At that time, the very nature of the atma itself, which is free from misery, produces the, the feeling of Atma Ananda. The sense of being freed from any kind of misery. But the Atma also has another quality. It's mentioned in Chandogya Upanishad. Rasam evam labdanandi bhavati. It has the ability to experience bliss unlimitedly. You understand? So it's not simply by understanding the Atma to be free from material energy and therefore feeling a sense of the absence of misery gives a certain pleasure. But the Atma also has capability to experience bliss beyond that. One kind of blissful experience beyond that is the experience of the spiritual substance called Brahman. Bhagavan has three features we know from Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, Brahman, Paramatma and Bhagavan. Right? So this Brahman is actually the direct substantive effulgence of Bhagavan. So Adi Sridhar Swami also mentioned when he commented on the verse of Brahmano hi pratishtaham, like the verse in Bhagavad Gita, when he commented on that, he said that this Brahman has the qualities of Bhagavan. Um, how do you how, how, how would I say it? That are unrevealed. The presence of the qualities are there unrevealed. So let me try to give an example. If you see the impersonal representation of something you can get an idea of the quality of the person from whom that expression came. If you hear, I'm giving just a mundane example, if you hear a recording of a musical presentation and you say, oh, this is amazing, outstanding, so forth, so on, you don't know the artist, right? But that presentation, though being uh, impersonal to some degree because the person is not there, it gives indication by the quality of that presentation something about the person. In the same way, that's a very gross, rough example, but in the same way, Adi Sridhar Swami is saying, in the Brahma Jyoti, there's some experience of the nature of the source of the Brahma Jyoti. Because he quotes, Brahma Rohi Pratishtaham. This Brahman is situated uh, as the effulgence of the Bhagavan's body. You understand? So now, those who have a higher experience of Ananda may come in contact with that Brahma Jyoti and therefore they will experience Brahma Ananda. And this Brahma Ananda is higher than the experience of Atma Ananda. Understand? From the position of Atma Ananda, because there's no real standing in spiritual energy, it is possible to again come to the material world. Also, for those who, in the practice of jnana or yoga, 
under the influence of mayavad. So mayavad means, vad means to like a theory. So to espouse a theory that the form of Bhagavan, when it comes into the material universes to perform a leela, is in the mode of material goodness and hence has some tinge of maya. This is called mayavad. There are many other aspects to mayavad, but this is the essential thing. And because of that, that presentation, there is an inherent aparad to the transcendental nature of the form of Bhagavan. And because of that, even when somebody realizes a mm, freedom from the material energy, but they're imbued with that aparad of believing that the form of Bhagavan can contain Maya, they can never have contact with the actual spiritual substance. So this is expressed in the verse, Ye Mukti Maninas, Toi Avishuddha Budaya. So Avishuddha means that they have not come in contact with Sudha Sattva purely. They've not contacted actual spiritual substance. But by the influence of their Gyan and Yo, they have been able to disassociate themselves from the material energy. But that position is not tenable as a stable position. Therefore, they can fall from that position back to the material world, and Srimad Bhagavatam is expressed in one purport, that they generally fall into the mode of material goodness. They become philanthropists, uh, social workers, etc., etc. Now, hmm, big, big thing here, which is not commonly heard. <laughs> In Prihad Bhagavatam Rita of Srila Shanatin Goshami Pad, it is mentioned there, Muktas Tasya hmm, Tach Chakti Satchita Nanda Dehinam Prapitas. So, it's mentioned that even when a person does genuinely enter into Brahman. Now, Srila uh, Baladev Vijabhushan Prabhu, he's written that it is never possible that the Jivatma actually becomes one with Brahman. It's not possible. Only the Abhiman, only the conception of having becoming one with the spiritual energy uh, is felt by the Atma. But he gave the example, if you take one drop of water and you put it into the ocean, has that drop merged with the ocean? From one angle of vision, you could say yes, but he says no, because eternally that drop increased the ocean by one drop. So in the same way, Krishna has made it clear in Bhagavad Gita, Jiva Bhuta Sanatana, that the Jiva is a category which is eternally manifest as that category. So the jiva can never become one with Bhagavan by becoming one with the Brahman effulgence. So there is still independent existence, even in Brahman, only there's the absence of a spiritual identity, spiritual, uh, any spiritual conception other than the realization of the taste of Brahman and Brahmananda. But here in Briyad Bhagavatam Rita, Srila uh, Sanatana Goswami Pada said, and also in the Tika, that's there, the commentary that's there, that if by association with the qualities inherent in the Brahma Jyoti, the Atma still has Kartatwa. Kartatwa means the ability to have spiritual desire. And if in that spiritual desire from tasting Brahman, some desire to want to experience Ananda in a deeper way, then that will reveal a higher form of uh, of Ananda, which then would be realization of Paramatma or realization of Bhagavan. So then the question that's asked in Bhagavatam Bhagavatamrita, but wait, how could that be possible? If now you don't have a body to do sadhana to realize that, how will this happen? So he quotes this verse, Muktasya Tasya, Muktasya Tasya, Tach Chakti Satchirananda Dehina Prapitas. By the Shakti of Bhagavan, the Ananda Shakti, of Bhagavan inherent in Brahman that's giving Ananda, that jiva can then experience a desire for a higher feature of Ananda, which then gives revelation of the source of that Brahman, which is Bhagavan himself. You understand? So don't think of Brahma Jyoti as a, a life sentence or something uh, of condemnation. 
So where we've heard the statements of, it's like committing spiritual suicide. It's like uh, becoming nothing, etc., etc. These are statements made by those who realize the ananda inherent in bhakti. Because later on, Sanatana Goswami Pad will also write about the insignificance of this Brahman realization in comparison to bhakti. So this is a comparative view based on looking at the ananda inherent in bhakti and looking at the ananda inherent in Brahman. You understand? So when anyone has desire to taste, because even in Shishastak must mention, Anandam Bhuti Vardhanam. The word Vardhanam in Sanskrit means expands. So Ananda can expand. Understand? Ananda is not limited. Okay, this is your payout. You did Gyan and Yoga. You wanted Brahman. Here's your Brahman. That's it. Bas. You're finished. <laughs> so it's not like that. Because in the 21 qualities mentioned, Bhoktatva, Kartatva, or also part of the 21 qualities. Bhoktatva means the ability to enjoy. Here, enjoyment means the enjoyment that naturally comes as an inherent part of spiritual connection. You understand? And Kartatva means doership. Though you're not the doer in relation to material energy, one has Kartatva or capacity to be the doer in relation to serving Bhagavan. So if one is still having any abhilas, means desire separate from Bhagavan, but has no material desire, it will manifest one of those features of spiritual existence like Atmananda, Brahmananda, even up to Vaikuntha liberation. Means Sarsti, Samipya, Sarupya, Salokya. That's why that verse says, I don't want any of these kinds of liberation, Vinamak, Sevanajana, if it is void of service to Bhagavan. Because there are people who practice even worshipping Lord Narayan, to obtain mukti in Vaikuntha. You understand? And Srila Jiva Goswami, not Srila Rupa Goswami Pad, has addressed this in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, and it is quoted <clears throat> in the fourth verse of Manasiksha. Uh, my Guru Paraparma, Nitta Lila Praveshtho, Mishnu Paraparmaksa, Sotara Sissima, Srila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj. He gives this quote in the Commentary to the fourth verse of Manasiksha that there is Shukya Aishwarya Uttara Bhakti. That means those who have a desire to obtain Vaikuntha in order to serve Narayan, but they also want to taste the happiness derived from that service and derived from the experience of the Aishwarya of uh, Vaikuntha. Then he says, even this extends, Prem Seva Uttara Bhakti means. Those who want to go to Braj, but in their heart, they have a desire for being liberated in Braj. It means, I have a desire to taste the happiness of obtaining love for Krishna. You understand? And I'll be in Braj, and the sweetness of Jamuna, sweetness of Krishna's Lila, etc., I'll be happy from that. That's why Rupa Goswami's definition of pure bhakti is very important. Anya abhilasita sunya. No other desire... No other desire for anything else except Anukulena Krishna Anusilana. All seal, seal that means endeavors, all endeavors for the Anukul, favorable savor of Krishna. You understand? Just like it's also mentioned there. Atma suke duke gopio nakara Gopis have no consideration of their own happiness. All their endeavors only what will make Krishna happy. And this becomes manifest like in Gopi Geet, the last verse, Yate Sujata Chalanam Burunam Staneshu. In this verse, it is called the Vasikrita verse because it is so imbued with love that is selfless that Bhagavan can no longer hide himself. Avir Bacha, what is this verse? Tasam Avir Bacha Chori, Smaya Maramukam Bojam, Pitam Baradara Swagri, Sakshat Manmat Manmat. It forces Krishna to reappear before the Gopis because this verse contains the elements of love in a selfless way at the highest degree. So really it's unmotivated, uninterrupted, loving service to Bhagavan, which is pure bhakti according to our aspirations. But there are several levels below that. So to answer Didi's question more directly, from Brahman one can obtain higher status. Now some will say, well no, Brahman is eternal. 
You understand? So how could once you get there, you're stuck there, right? Eternally. No. Eternality is not like a jail sentence or something. Eternality is the absence of the influence of prakatkal, means material time. There's not past, present, and future as an influence. You understand? In the spiritual world, certainly there's time, or we would not have ashtakari or lila. <laughs> you understand? But time is a servant to prem lila. It has no influence. That's why the ras lila could go on for one night of Brahma. And still, Shana uh, Kalpato, according to Ujjalani Mani, it felt like it was only one minute for the gopis. Because time does not have a, a mm, influence in the, in the spiritual world uh, like it does here. In fact, in Srimad Bhakta, I think it's the second canto, it's mentioned there, Na Cha Kala Vikramaha. That Kal, Prakat Kal, material time, has no influence in the spiritual world. And Al Srila Prabhupada used to say the phrase, time is conspicuous by its absence in the spiritual world. Understand? So we should not think of eternality as like how we calculate time. Uh, one way to describe um, um, time in the spiritual world is called Nitya Vartmanakal. Vartmana means present. So an eternally present existence. You understand? That's a better way to understand it. Eternally present existence. So even those in Brahman, they're in eternity because they're in a place where the influence of Prakatkal has no influence. Material time has no influence. But it doesn't mean they've been condemned to you got to stay in the Brahma Jyoti forever. <laughs> because there's still an Atma. And that Atma can still have Icha, desire. And the ability to execute that desire. So by the creeper coming from Bhagavan himself, based on that, they can obtain Satchitananda Dehinam Prapitas. Prapta means to obtain Deha means Satchitananda bodies to serve Bhagavan. So this is written in Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, if anybody wants to promote for this. Right? I know the verse is 207, I think it's second canto, maybe verse 207 or something. Right? Oh, well, let me see. Other question. I don't even know if I have time to get to the other question. I still have to cook the offering here. Uh, let me see. I'll quickly get back to it and see if I can address that. Oh, second question was, considering all of Sri Krishna's magnificence and power, and creation, why is Kali allowed to be manifest for an entire yuga? So, Diddy's question was then, which is the question of a lot of people, if God is so merciful, why would he allow the influence of any kind of evil at any time? That's one view. Secondly, especially according to our Gaudiya theology, we recognize there is a period uh, of 432,000 years, which is called Kali Yuga. Right? So the question would be why is it that Bhagavan allows our entire period to be dedicated to the influence of Kali? And of course, if you read the qualities of Kali Yuga, like Manda Sumanda Matiyo, Manda Bhagi Yu, Bhadruta, everyone will be short lived, unlucky, always disturbed, etc. You could think, well, if Krishna is so merciful, magnificent, this, that, why would there be within even his Shristi Lila, means his material creation, a period of time? when this sort of influence would be allowed to exist, especially for such a duration of time, right? The answer is, again, the experience of Kali Yuga or not Kali Yuga is not there in the Atma, it's in the vicarious identification of the Atma with the material world. So no byproduct of suffering, which is existent in the influence of the three modes of material nature and the material energy, actually has anything to do with the Atma. The Atma's influence uh, vicariously in connection with the modes of nature, etc., is producing that idea. That's why Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur in the 16th chapter of Jaiva Dharma, he very mm, expertly outlined that idea by saying, Bhagavan has unlimited amounts of Leela, and at the same time, Bhagavan is unlimitedly compassionate, if it was not for this Shristi Lila, means material creation, how would those Bada Jivas have an opportunity to then be delivered? What would be the mechanism of their deliverance? If Bhagavan did not have the Shristi Lila in which he came to perform so many different Lilas under so many conditions, under which he had so many devotees roaming the earth, 
under which mm, he came and performed leelas that could be recorded, like I mentioned in the beginning, and anybody can hear these leelas and obtain bhakti for Bhagavan, right? Then how would the jivas be delivered? <laughs> so actually, Bhagavan has no fault here. There is no fault in the idea that a period like Kali exists. This is an intrinsic quality of the material energy, that it has a spiritually climatic seasons, so to speak. Satya Yug, then Dwarpa, then Treta, excuse me, uh, Satya, sat, Satya Yug, Treta Yug, Dwarpa Yug, Kali Yug. Actually, I'm saying that because really, uh, when Krishna appears, the ages become reversed. But normally it would be Satya Yug, Treta Yug, Dwarpa Yug, Kali. You understand? Oh, excuse me, Satya Dwarpa Treta Kali. But whenever Krishna Mahaprabhu appears in that particular period of time, the ages reverse. And there's been different reasons given for it, but basically it becomes Satya Yug, then Dwa, uh, Treta Yug, then Dwapa Yug, then Kali. Now, especially in the 28th cycle of the Yuga cycle, once in a day of Brahma, Sri Krishna appears. And after Sri Krishna appears, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appears. That Kali Yuga is called Danya Kali. Because Danya means like a, a gift. Because in that Kali Yuga, the most amazing spiritual phenomenon takes place. What is that phenomenon? Chiraratha Dham Nija Gupta Vitam Swanama Prema Amrita Atyudhara. That normally the Yuga Dharma in Kali Yuga is Harinam. Every Kali Yuga, it's Harinam. But in all other Kali Yugas, a Gora Narayan. Not Sri Sachinandan Gora Hari, but a form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu called Gora Narayan appears, and the Yuga Dharma is Nam. But it is not the same name that's given by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who appears as the combined form of Radha and Krishna after Krishna Lila. That form of Mahaprabhu imbues Hari Nam, Swanama Prema Amrit, Atyudara. He imbues Hari Nam with Prema Amrit, the nectar of praying. More amazing, Apamara Yovita Tara Gora. Apamara means the most fallen. So the most fallen persons, as demonstrated in the Leela of Jagai and Madai, the most fallen persons get access to the highest form of love. You understand? The most treasured gift is Radha Dasyam. And Mahaprabhu comes and Apita Chivim Chirat Karu Navitirna Kalo Sumat Payatam Una to Ujola Rasa Swa Bhakti Sriyam. Mahaprabhu comes and he gives the ability to serve the mood of Radhika's mother Nakya Mahabal. The highest kind of love, period. That happens in the Danya Kali. So there's a sort of genius in the madness, so to speak, of how the Srishti Leela works. And once anyone has the mercy of sadhu, guru, and they come into the right perspective, then they can see all of these things clearly. That the atma, the atma never touches material energy. It's only a vicarious identification, much like watching a movie and becoming so absorbed in the movie or the drama play that you start to feel the emotional content of the ups and downs, fear, anger, all the different emotional situations according to that movie or that drama. But factually, the jiva is always situated in its own nature and it does not come out of that nature. So everything is vicarious, means by identification only. You understand? So Bhakti Vinod Thakur, 16th chapter, Jabba Dami points out, no, nobody's actually really suffering. And even if you considered you were suffering, after you come to the point of realizing the nature of loving God, then how can you look back and say it was suffering when the end result was this? Because then the idea would be whatever happened to get to this point was strictly the creep of Bhagavan. And that's why one very important verse is right? That we have to have the perspective that whatever's going on in my life, that Atma Kritam, Vipakam, it was due to something that I've done previously. You understand? That's our mindset. This is no punishment from Bhagavan. The fact that there's a Kali Yuga is not some punishment from Bhagavan. And if he's merciful, and I know maybe somebody asked this question to Didi because Didi's a very learned person, so she knows 
uh, these these tatfas, right? But maybe to answer the question of someone who asked, because this is a, in fact, I can't remember what it's called, but actually there's a whole study in academic circles of this phenomenon. Why do bad things happen to good people if there's a God? I can't remember what the, they always have academic names for these things. I can't think of what it's called offhand. I don't want to misstate it. But it is a consideration that happens even among the general population. Well, why do bad things happen to so-called good people? But, you know, for some people, they don't take into account what is karma. That's one thing. Secondly, most people look at things only from their own self-interest. My Sunday Zoom facilitation, the, the class I facilitated by Diddy's Arrangement, actually, on Sunday, we spoke about that, the conception of I, me, and mine. <laughs> Whenever there's I, me, and mine, it mathematically equals Maya. <laughs> and when there's Hari, Guru, and Vaishnav, it equals Satya. And by the realization of Satya, or truth, one can understand one's own real identity, which is Dasitva, Dasosmi. You understand? In the first equation, I, me, and mine, Everything starts with I, with me. You understand? I, then me, how I'm related to other things, then mine, how I consider other things my property for my enjoyment. And then that expands into we, our, them, they, because then it expands into how I'm relating to other people. Either I'm collectively identifying them in my enjoyment process as we or our, Right or my perceived suffering process, we, our, we're suffering, etc. Or they, them, usually is applied when somebody has an opposite view of things, <laughs> right? And we're we're pointing out to they or them in some way, form, or fashion from our I-centric perspective. But when we look at things from Hari, means God-centered Hari, and then Guru and Vaishnav, because Guru and Vaishnav are the Prakash, means the manifestation of Hari in our purview, in our vision. You understand? When we look at things through that purview, because we don't see Hari. Even the super soul, which is right here, we don't have transcendental experience of. But we see in our experience, right? Like in Guru Asthakam, Sakshadharidvena Samashta Shastri. Shastri says, Shri Guru Deva Sakshadharidva. Means he's the Prakash, manifestation of Hari and Hari's power in our purview, right? So, if we see things from the perspective of Hari, then Guru and Vaishnav, then this is true, this is Satya. Maya means literally, one etymological breakdown of Maya is, Ma means not, Ya means this. Not this, this is not true. Similarly, Sat means what is actual existence. So actual existence, Satya, which is, we say truth, right? equals realization of your actual identity, which is Daso Smi. Like it's quoted, uh, Daso, uh, what is it? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Daso Bhutti Hari Eva Nanya Sheva Karachana. That actually we're the Daso of Krishna, you cannot be something else. That's a Tattva, that's a Satya, that's a truth. So we are Daso Smi. And when you see things from that perspective, then you begin to see the world in relation to service to Hari for one, but you all see it in relation to, to Bhagavan. That how the world is configured, how the time within the material energy is configured, this is all the Leela of Bhagavan. And if it is Bhagavan's desire, a servant facilitates that desire. I also mentioned yesterday, we use the word servant uh, as the translation of the word Das. But really there's much deeper meaning to Das here. Das, really, the culmination of Dasitva is praying, is love. So inherent in the idea of Dasitva is really praying. So Dasitva doesn't just describe a servant, because when we utilize servant, then the connotations of servant in this world are very different. So it's very difficult to make the leap into what is the spiritual contextual meaning of Das. The contextual meaning of Das in spiritual paradigm is love. Right? To be the palya dasi of radhika, radha dasyam. This is about prem. It's not about um, servitude according to the material calculation of what is a servant, because a servant can serve a master and hate the master, <laughs> right? 
So, but certainly in the spiritual paradigm, Dasitva means the nature of praying. So it is, it is really kind of late, and I do need to continue with other services here for the day, but Didi, especially because she's very special to me, I've known her very many years, and so forth and so on, and there are other people who did write in questions I did not forget. I will try to catch up on those which are there. For those who I didn't answer directly, because some people I just answered directly. Also, uh, one devotee uh, um, was asking about the Sunday Zoom classes, I post them whenever I get them. I do post them. Uh, but one devotee then sent a link. And this is probably something that's a, a failure on my part. That in serving our Guru Vargas Harikata, I've not been conscientious about, I've been more conscientious about keeping the Facebook live and categorizing and everything. But sometimes I give, you know, Harikata someplace or something and I, I'm not as attentive who's recording, what's going on, so forth, so on. But one devotee, sent me a link, <laughs> and it has all the uh, service to Harikata that I have attempted in, in by the mercy of my Gurudev over a period of time. And he sent me a link where they're all situated in one place. So I sent that link to a couple of devotees. Uh, maybe I'll put it here in the chat or something, and then devotees can have access to it, and so forth and so on, if they have any interest like that. Uh, but yeah, so there's some lacking on my part in that regard. My wife used to say, you know, you have to arrange somehow to categorize things and so forth. But, you know, I've always had more interest in just doing a simple service uh, because for my own edification as well, right? And I've always considered there are many high class of devotees, so much of these things can be learned uh, by so many people who do have already established libraries, so to speak, of, of the Harikata and so forth. Uh, but my wife says I still should not shrink away from that responsibility, and I agree. And by mercy of Shri Guru Dev, the devotee sent that link. So let me see, I don't know, uh, I guess I can put it, oh yeah. So I'll put this link in the comment here, and I think that'll work. I always say service to Harikata too. Some people have asked why I say that. And the reason is because the Harikata does not belong to any single person. The Harikata is a manifestation of the mercy of our Guru Vargas. And we're serving that Harikata. Whether we're listening or whether we're speaking, we're actually serving the Harikata. It is not our possession. And if anybody begins to think like that, then obviously some pride will come, everything, and this will take away Bhakti. Okay, so I'm just putting this link and then... Mm -hmm. Alright, so hopefully that... Oh, wait a minute. Alright, well I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it up here. Uh, let me see that. Alright. Uh, no, let me see. I don't know. It wouldn't let me put the link. So anyways, afterwards what I'll do is I'll go on afterwards and I'll put the link below that statement there because it somehow didn't take when I did it just now. I devote is Dandavat Pranam, Pancha Kalpatruvisha, Kripash in the Vebacha, Patitanam Pavanavio Vaishnavi, Bionamo Namaha, Jai Radhe Radhe.